Our second panelist is Jared Bernstein. He's a senior fellow at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. And he's been very active for many years thinking about the labor market, inequality, and macro policy from his positions both within the Obama administration and in various think tanks here in DC. And you can read more about his thoughts at his blog on the economy. So let me turn the presentation over to Dash. Okay, thank you very much, Stephanie. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, how do I? Oh, thank you. Mm. Let me see. Okay. So, in the spirit of making disclaimers, I should also make the disclaimer that the views expressed here and in the following discussion are my own. They don't necessarily reflect the, the views of my colleagues at the Federal Reserve Board or the research staff at the Federal Reserve System as a whole. With that said, I'll start my presentation by illustrating some of the points that our former Fed Chair Janet Yellen made in her opening remarks. So the first chart is a chart of the four quarter changes in US core inflation as measured by the PC price index since the 1970s. And you can see that inflation dynamics have changed dramatically over the past half a century. Over the past 25 years, inflation has been considerably lower than over the preceding 25 years. Furthermore, over the past two decades, inflation has, core inflation has moved in a relatively narrow range, despite big swings in oil and other commodity prices, the Great Recession, and unprecedented monetary policy actions. So, I think over, we can say that over the past two decades, inflation, core inflation, can be well characterized empirically as uh, in terms of transitory movements around a stable long-term stochastic trend. These fluctuations, in turn, can reflect changes in slack, supply shocks, or other temporary influences. And Economists often view the stability of the trend over the past two decades as resulting from better anchored inflation expectations or the inflation outcomes themselves that have been engineered by monetary policy. However, there's not that much hard evidence to support that view. Now, turning to Slack, uh, I just want to give a little bit of a background about the Phillips curve. In the late 1950s, William Phillips documented a negative relationship between wage growth and the unemployment rate. Uh, and soon thereafter, economists confirmed this relationship for a lot of other uh, developed economies. Now, labor costs are about 60% of the firm's production costs. So intuitively, they should matter a lot for the pricing of firms. And indeed, in the mid-60s, Samuelson and Sowell pointed to a negative relationship between the unemployment rate and price inflation, which we now refer, and we refer to this negative relationship these days as the Phillips curve. This curve, this relationship, has also changed a lot over the past half a century. So what I've plotted here, the black line is still again core inflation in the US, and the green line is the difference between the unemployment rate and an estimate of the natural rate of, an un of the unemployment, which in this case is the Congressional Budget Office estimate. And when I talk about the relationship having changed, I want to point out the, the gray bars are the recessions. Um, I want to point out that in the early 90s and the early 80s, when the unemployment rate moved up above the natural rate of unemployment, which means the green, the green line went above the zero line, uh, Inflation declined markedly, and in addition, each of these recessions had a persistent effect on, on inflation. Now, if you, if you uh, look to the latest uh, 2009 recession, you, you don't see such a decline in, in, the, uh, in the inflation, even though the, the unemployment rate gap went up. 
And uh, so, so inflation didn't come as much as it did in previous downturns, and the models we were using back then could not explain the behavior of this inflation. So the failure of, of the models to explain this have triggered a lot of research and a lot of papers. And I'll just mention the names of a few of those papers. Robert Gordon's 2013 paper was The Phillips Curve is Alive and Well. But then Murphy in 2018 wrote about the death of the Phillips Curve. Blinder in 2018 uh, is the Phillips Curve death. And then most recently, Hooper, Mishkin, and Sufi's title was Is the Phillips Curve dead or is it just hibernating? And I think there's a fairly broad consensus that the relationship between uh, unemployment and inflation has changed, but I don't think economists agree whether inflation has become completely disconnected from real activity. So today I will argue that yes, the Phillips curve relationship is not the same as 20 years ago, but it has not completely disappeared. And I think that the Phillips curve framework is still a useful framework to think about when discussing inflation dynamics. In the rest of my presentation, I will provide an update of a research that I've done with Jeremy Ratt, one of my colleagues who is also here, that has allowed us to, to look at the uh, responses of different economic variables over time. So the model is a vector autoregression model uh, whose uh, coefficients are allowed to change over time, which allows us to, to look at responses. And on the left panels, uh, we've pl plotted the responses of labor cost growth to an unemployment gap shock. And on the right, it's the responses of core inflation to an unemployment gap shock. Um, just forgot to mention, in this VAR, we have four variables, a measure of inflation, which is core market-based PC inflation for the US, uh, relative import prices, a measure of slack, uh, which is the unemployment rate gap, and, um, and wages, or uh, unit labor costs um, in this case. Uh, and as you will see in the left panel, uh, the, the response of labor costs uh, to the unemployment gap shock have changed, but not that much. At the same time, the response of core inflation to unemployment shock has changed a lot. And this is the same thing you can observe in standard Phillips curve models. What, what I will also say that even though uh, the red line, which is uh, the latest uh, response uh, let's say, uh, to, uh, to an unemployment gap shock is very small. It's, it's not non-existent. It's still there. And, and if, we, if you look at the decomposition of recent movements in inflation, so the inflation is plotted as the black line, there's a baseline forecast from this model, which is the red dashed line, and then the baseline model plus the effect of the structural shocks. In this case, we look at the effect of the unemployment gap shock. And you can see that the unemployment or slack in the economy is still an important factor for low frequency movements in inflation. Um, so since, since this is a discussion of uh, labor markets and inflation, I would like to address one question that we very often get, get is, are we measuring slack appropriately? Is the unemployment gap an inadequate measure of slack? And these are all good questions. But going back to this picture, I want to point out this thing. The fact that we don't see a flattening of the wage Phillips curve, but we see a flattening of the price Phillips curve means that it would be very hard to explain what we see on the right, but what we see on the left. It's, it's just not coming entirely from the, uh, from the labor market developments. And, and there are other things going on, and that's why we are not the only panel presenting today. <laughs> so uh, it, it just against the, the background of all these um, changes, long-term changes uh, in inflation dynamics that I plotted on the first slide, it has become increasingly difficult to discern the effect of a single factor. That doesn't mean it's not important, it's just difficult. 
and it can be obscured by other factors that are affecting inflation. Okay. So before I pass on um, to Jared, I would like to, again, reiterate two things. Over the last couple of decades, we've seen two major changes. One is the change in the trend, which is now much more stable. The second is that we have a flatter Phillips curve. The thing is we don't perfectly understand the reasons behind those changes. We have hypotheses, and a lot of research has been done, and a lot of research is going on now, but I don't think we have a very good understanding of what's driving them, which, meets, which leads me to the final point that from a policy perspective, it's worrisome how much, how much do we think these trends will continue in the future? What will take us to move them away from there? And can we exploit the stability uh, in a productive way? Thank you. Well, thanks very much, and thanks for inviting me. Uh, the Hutchins Center always has the most, uh, comes uh, up with uh, the most interesting topics and, and gets uh, press and company excluded, the most interesting people to talk about them. Uh, so this is a, a real a great opportunity. Um, I'm going to buzz through a, a number of points that have just been relentlessly made today, uh, so I don't feel I have to spend my uh, precious time on them. Uh, the first, uh, I thought Katya took us through in extremely clear fashion. Um, others have noted that the wage PC is steeper than the price PC, and I think that's um, uh, uh, important for what I'm going to talk about in a somewhat uh, uh, different way that hasn't been raised today, although uh, Janet Yellen referenced this in her talk. Uh, and that is the opportunity that uh, the uh, persistence of low and stable inflation in the flatter Phillips curve provides for us in terms of achieving much tighter labor markets uh, persistently and the benefits that those yield to people who are uh, frequently left behind in slack uh, periods. Uh, and so that's going to be the core of my discussion to you today, the opportunity that these dynamics present to us uh, in helping some folks who really need the help. Um, the, uh, the labor market actually explicits, we, uh, as, as uh, Katja suggested, uh, uh, we are here to try to talk about the uh, role of the labor market. It actually expa explains a, an increasing share of the variance in prices, more so than I thought. Uh, um, but uh, 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 we, uh, you know, we still have, uh, that doesn't undermine the uh, opportunity that I, I mentioned. And these gains, by the way, this won't surprise this crowd, the gains that I'm going to talk about and show you uh, that uh, are engendered by this opportunity, they're not just about equalizing wage pressure. I tend to, uh, in my presentations about this, because I've been working on this area and the benefits of full employment for a long time, I tend to emphasize how the elasticities are larger for lower uh, paid workers, and that's really important, and in that sense, full employment is equalizing. But what I'm going to talk about today is more about labor opportunities for people left behind on the labor supply side. Um, the Kind of canonical now uh, story about the uh, wage uh, Phillips curve being more uh, steep and on, on the left hand side, uh, you know, quite nonlinear. Uh, this is just the uh, unemployment gap plotted against a, uh, a principal components mashup of five different wage series. It's a very familiar line. On the right hand side, it's much more of a random story. The one thing I wanted to raise about this, to, or the two things I wanted to raise about this today, is the first, which is consistent with my theme, which is le less wage price pass through, which is the implication of this and something we've already heard about from the stage today, not zero, but less wage price pass through further underscores the opportunity of a flat Phillips curve to um, run lower for longer unemployment and tap the benefits that I'm going to show you in a minute. But I also think that this slide poses a bit of a challenge to those who want to argue that um, the regional Phillips curve is uh, perhaps uh, a more important one or a more valid one or certainly a better identified one given the variance and the observations. There's a lot more variance in unemployment if you get below the subnational level. Um, well, we have a wage Phillips curve that's actually decently identified from the national data and it's tapping the same national variance in the unemployment rate. So um, 
uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm a, a, a very interested in the, in, in the fact that the regional Phillips curves tend to be steeper, the ones at the MSA or the state level, uh, but I'm not sure that that so, you know, seals the deal as, po as to you know, solving the mystery uh, because the weight, national wage Phillips curve remains alive and well. So how much var uh, variance does the uh, uh, um, uh, unemployment, uh, does the labor market explain anyway? So this is a, a very, very simple exercise that I think, uh, you know, is hopefully uh, somewhat uh, uh, revealing in the sense that if you just, uh, just regress the change in core inflation on inflation expectations, and then you take that residual, so you net out the part of the variance in inflation that explained by uh, expectations, and then you do a rolling regression on the residual using the U minus U star or the U gap series, and I, I think so far today we've only used CBO's uh, U star just because that's just a mouse click away, and uh, so there's that. Uh, at any rate, um, and, and then you just start peeling off the R squares from that. This, so, so this slide shows you um, how much of the variance in inflation does the labor market, or at least the unemployment gap, explain? And in recent years, it hasn't explained very much at all, but it started to climb up. And this is uh, very much consistent with Katya's point that it's not everything, but it's not nothing either. And in fact, uh, something like 12% of the variance uh, is, uh, is explained, and uh, therefore 12% of our time today should be spent talking about the labor market. <laughs> we're going to be. Um, OK, this is the core of what I wanted to talk about. These dynamics create an opportunity. Yes, there's a flat Phillips curve, but at least as important, we've had, of course, decades of higher inequality, long-term real stagnation for middle and low-wage workers, lots of people in places left behind, and bargaining power deficits that are offset by full employment. And so I recently wrote a paper with Keith Bentley where we concluded that uh, these changing inflation dynamics in tandem with the bullet points I just went through should create an asymmetry in the Fed's reaction function as such dynamic uh, elevate the benefits of full employment and diminish the risks of inflationary pressures. Now I say that with uh, recognition of Janet's point that uh, those risks haven't gone away and in fact the flat Phillips curve uh, could uh, um, uh, be a problem on the other side if you're, if you're hit with inflationary, uh, persistent inflationary shocks. Um, I also cite David Merkel. He's, he's an analyst from Goldman Sachs, uh, uh, I think a very insightful inflation analyst, and he makes the same point, and I only put that in there because he's, uh, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm sort of associated with uh, the left side of the spectrum, and so there's my point. Uh, here's uh, 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 an inflation analyst arguing that, you know, the tight labor market poses less risk today and policymakers can exploit the disinflationary effects to run the labor market hot as long as inflation expectations stay anchored. I think that's really important uh, and the key to, to my presentation. Um, here is some new work that I uh, just released uh, this morning on my blog with Keith Bentley. It's going to become a paper for our full employment project. And this gets to the benefits of full employment in ways that um, uh, you probably haven't seen before. Um, <clears throat> we take the bot right? The, the, we look at all the different quintiles, but for this presentation, I'm focusing on the lowest income workers, looking at prime age workers. And on the left-hand side, you basically have what's an employment rate. It's an annual measure. So it's a little different than the employment rate that we look at every month from the BLS. But what this shows is the blue line is the employment rate, and it's very cyclical. So these folks are very responsive to the cycle in terms of their labor supply crossing the extensive margin. And uh, the prediction there simply uses the unemployment rate and a lag-dependent variable to predict the line. And at some level, you're just saying, OK, one cyclical variable predicts another cyclical variable. This is the only quintile it works for. If you look at three, four, or five, you don't see much at all. So it's particularly a story for low-wage workers. They're the ones who are going to be most helped by this opportunity that low inflation bequeaths to us. And, uh, and so what, what I have on the right, I know there are a lot of numbers there, but I'm just going to focus on the, uh, on the circled ones. Um, so we, we look at the share working in the bottom quintile, and I'm looking at the 1990s because it was such a high-pressure labor market. Now, some of you are thinking there were a lot of other stuff going on in the 90s. There was welfare reform, EITC expansion, minimum wage increase, all true. But there was also a really high-pressure labor market. And in fact, if you look at the earnings of uh, low-income uh, workers, and this includes zeros, okay? This is this is not this is if you if you have earnings or if you don't, they grew by 50% or 50 log points. And because uh, the um, 
the, the three columns are multiplicative to the all earnings column, you can do a log decomposition. And basically, the story is that half of that increase, 23% over 49%, or almost half of that increase, uh, is crossing the extensive margin, coming into the job market. Okay? Uh, if you look at the, for African Americans, their earnings, and I'm including zeros, so annual earnings, including zeros, more than doubled over this high pressure labor market, and half of the increase was crossing the extensive margin, was increasing in the share of work. And that shifts in reverse in the bottom panel. Uh, you know, it, when, when the economy sniffles, uh, the uh, more economically vulnerable folks uh, catch pneumonia. And in the, in the downturn, um, the, uh, you know, half of those income gains were reversed, fell 50 percent, and, you know, uh, and, and three-fifths of that decline was people uh, crossing the extensive margin the other way. So the costs to um, uh, slack in the job market are particularly borne uh, by this group, but the benefits are, uh, are, are, are quite pronounced. Um, in our paper, we also show the most recent period, the one we're in right now, of tight labor markets. And while the gains aren't as dramatic as they were in the hot uh, uh, 90s labor market, uh, they are comparable and they are uh, economically significant and large. Very important to these folks. So now what I have here is just the unemployment gap, and thanks to my excellent RA, I was able to do a dynamic slide. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and, and here are just some headlines, recent headlines. So these are headlines over the last, you know, few months. Tight labor market, disability may not be a barrier. I thought I was done. Uh, op open doors for convicts. Lower income Americans are increasingly job hopping in order to uh, uh, in uh, uh, tap uh, some uh, wage increases. So in conclusion, I want to thank uh, the Federal Reserve uh, for recognizing uh, this opportunity, and if you listen to the words of, of uh, Jay Powell and, and others, other uh, federal officials who are, former Fed officials who are here said much of the same thing, you will hear him expressly making these connections. Uh, so I, I wanted to thank the, the Fed for that, for, for tapping those benefits, and I also want to thank uh, the American people for their anchored expectations, which are, are, <laughs> which are key to all of this. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, so I just want to thank our panelists again for those great presentations. I have a lot of questions. We probably won't get through them all today. But um, one of the things I am curious about is how you're interpreting what's currently going on in the economy. So I think you both asserted, and we've heard other people this morning assert, that while the price Phillips curve seems to have flattened out a lot, there's still some action in the wage Phillips curve. But when I look at wage growth now, it looks to me that it's running at about the pace you would expect given productivity growth and inflation. So that doesn't actually seem to be suggestive of a hot labor market, which is how a lot of people are characterizing it. And I'm sort of curious how you, you know, interpret that. Is it actually some attenuation of the wage Phillips curve? Are there other things going on? Is the natural rate much lower? If you guys could uh, give your thoughts on that. Okay, I'll, I'll start. Um, so on that question, it's, uh, my presentation were more, was more focused on the long-term changes, uh, but it has been a constant question, why isn't inflation back to target, why, we aren't, why aren't we at, at 2%? And if, if you remember uh, the, the chart I showed decomposing recent movements on inflation and how slack can explain uh, why inflation was below uh, uh, the baseline forecast during the recession as the unemployment rate was high, it has, it has gone back to zero. So we don't get 
anything from Slack at this point, which uh, is understandable, but we are still not back to zero. So what has happened, if I had plotted, if I had time mm -hmm. to show another chart, I, I would have shown one that not only adds the, the structural effect of the unemployment rate, but also from import prices. And that could, that could explain a lot of what happened in 15 through 17 and 18. So, but it doesn't get us all the way there. And the third thing on which I didn't have time to focus was on the stochastic trend too much. And if you go back to the first chart, you will see that the stochastic trend and also the baseline forecast from the model is not 2%. It's more something closer to one and three quarters. So even though the, the trend has been very stable, it has not been at 2%. So that's my few explanations for uh, the last few years. I think there are three explanations to your, to your excellent question, because I think you're right. Uh, the first is that actually there's been a little stronger wage growth at the bottom, so you're citing the average. So uh, uh, this is consistent with my earlier point that the elasticities of wage growth relative to the tightening job market are stronger at the bottom of the scale. Um, the second uh, uh, point is that uh, is is probably maybe the most important is that probably uh, the job market really isn't quite at full employment yet. Uh, that may sound you know somewhat controversial given uh, how low unemployment is relative to these estimates of U star, but there's a huge confidence interval around uh, those estimates um, and. Uh, uh, just based on you know, the inflationary data and the wage data, we can get as complicated as we want, but I think a sort of first order simple uh, uh, realization is that we're probably not yet at full employment. Um, and then the third thing is, you know, worker bargaining power has just been so uh, severely diminished that uh, it, it's going to take not just, uh, you know, low unemployment, but very low unemployment for a very long time. Remember, the unionization share in this economy now in the private sector is somewhere uh, around 6 or 7 percent. Thanks. Um, so another question I wanted to get at was to try to tease out a little bit more what you think is going on with um, between about wage pass through into prices. So some of our other speakers this morning have talked about it, but looking at it from the perspective of the labor market now as well, you know, we still see some evidence of a wage Phillips curve, much less evidence of a price Phillips curve. Wages have picked up a little bit. Prices have been, inflation has been pretty flat, you know, core inflation. So what are your explanations for why these changes in wages aren't translating more into inflation, price inflation? Okay, so this again will build on research uh, we've done with uh, Jeremy Ratt on, on the past, because the, uh, from wages to prices, because doing what we do at the board, this is a question we very often get, and we struggle to explain why we don't include wages on the right-hand side of our price Phillips curve equations. So we, we again looked at the pass-through from wages to prices over time, and depending on what measure you use, if you, lose the, the, you use the more com comprehensive compensation per hour, you could see a steady decline over the years to the point where you don't see a pass-through from wages to prices. If you use the employment cost index, it's more stable, but not very big. Okay? Now, this is not to say that wages don't matter for prices. They should matter their two-thirds of production costs. But I think what, 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 what we found in this paper, that if you plot in addition to the stochastic trend that I showed for price inflation, if you do a similar one for uh, unit labor costs, you will see that they are both very stable. And in, in this, in this stable <laughs> stochastic trend environment, it's very hard to identify movements in wages that are translating to prices. In, in fact, what, what, what you find is that year to year movements in, in inflation, uh, in price inflation can, can reflect slack and can reflect uh, uh, import prices or other uh, idiosyncratic factors, but it's hard to identify movements from independent, um, pass through from independent wage movements to prices. Just, uh, I don't have a ton to say about this, but two points. Um, one is, uh, I, I really do uh, find this uh, relatively new literature on the impact of uh, firm concentration within key industries, uh, 
to be relevant to this conversation, to this question. Um, uh, you see this in retail, you see it in healthcare, you see it in technology. Dominant firms, now, you know, I sort of grew up in, a, in an economics where when, when uh, sort of monopolistic firms took hold, you saw it on the price side. We're not seeing it so much on the price side where you're seeing it is on the labor cost side. So you, you, you know, some good papers where uh, uh, firm concentration appears to be uh, 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 correlated with diminished labor share. So using your monopoly power to kind of uh, uh, screw workers instead of uh, 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 on the price side. Um, and, uh, you, know, I you know, I obviously uh, think that's problematic, and I think the tight labor market is starting to push back on that, even though labor share is still uncharacteristically low, even with a recent revision that took it up a bit, uh, it's still uncharacteristically low. And I walk around thinking that this is an important source, and I always tell this to my friends on the Fed who will listen to me, uh, that, that uh, the important caveat, um, uh, <laughs> that, the, uh, that there is, you know, that there's room for non-inflationary wage gains through a rebalancing of factor shares, through labor share catching up to something to its closer historical levels. Now, that's not a slam dunk, because firms will resist that and may try to pass it through on prices, but we haven't seen a lot of that, as your question implies. Interesting. So, um, I guess related to this, We've heard some talk this morning about whether we should be focusing on alternative measures of slack if the unemployment rate, I mean, the unemployment rate was never a comprehensive measure of slack, right? It was more a sufficient statistic for slack. But I think this does raise the question of whether it no longer serves that role as a sufficient statistic for slack and whether we need to be looking at a more comprehensive measure and we're getting a mixed signal about how much slack there is. Do you mind if I start with that? So I think that that is a fine point and we should all try different measures in our model, but it's actually, in my view, at least statistically, kind of overblown because um, I recently did a blog on this where I just correlated the unemployment rate with all the other measures I could think of, and the correlations are really, really high. I mean, they're all above 0.9 as for the most part. And my friend John Roberts is in the audience, an excellent uh, Fed uh, uh, economist, and has done, has done some work on sort of throwing a bunch of of these slack variables in, into a kind of Kalman filter washing machine and seeing what comes out. And as I believe, John will correct me if I'm misrepresenting this, you know, the unemployment rate kind of dominates. So yes, sure, other measures, but um, I wouldn't spend a ton of time on that. And I'll just reiterate the point from my presentation that I, I think it's, it's a very valid question and certainly one we should be looking at. But the fact that we don't have the flattening in the wage Phillips curve means there's something else going on in the price Phillips curve that does not come from uh, bargaining, necessarily bargaining power or, uh, or the right measure of slack. Great. Uh, so the last question I want to ask before I turn it over to the audience is, um, actually, Katya, I'm going to pick on you a little bit, which is, <laughs> you know, Jerry came out very strongly saying, not much inflation, Phillips curve seems flat, we have an opportunity here. You were sort of expressed, I would say, some concerns at the end of your talk, and I was sort of curious, like, do you think we have the space that Jared asks, knowing that this is you're not speaking for anyone in the Federal <laughs> Reserve System, you know, or do you think that the risks sort of dominate? Um, so since I'm not speaking for anybody, <laughs> I would say how I spent uh, my days at the Fed. And in the morning, I worry we are never going to get to 2%. <laughs> Underlying trend is lower. Uh, we have to do something in the afternoons. Like, what if there are non-linearities? <laughs> what if we lose control of inflation <laughs> expectations and we overshoot? So uh, I, I think I, I am worried that, that, that um, for example, if you look at the Michigan survey, expectations have moved lower. And, and, and some would argue that that's because, oh, people were just waking up and realizing inflation was never 3%. But that might not be all of it. It might be just a reaction to persistently low inflation that we've seen. And, and it would be great to push those up but only by three tenths. <laughs> and if we can do that, that's great. My concerns are how confident are we that we can run the economy code to exactly, to get it exactly. So again, I am on, on both ends worried. Yep. Uh, yeah, I, I don't want to create the misimpression that uh, I'm operating from a, you know, what, 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 nothing to worry about kind of uh, perspective on, on the threat of future inflationary pressures. I mean, I guess the thing I take from the conference uh, so far and, and, 
you know, all, all of the reading I've done up, up uh, in recent years on this is that I don't think we have a great, and I think I've heard Janet say something similar, she'll correct me if I'm wrong, I just don't think we have a great understanding of what's driving inflation dynamics uh, these days. And that means that for now, based on the empirical evidence that I and others have presented, uh, we can uh, tap the benefits that I, I was stressing as being so critically important to tap, given the history of uh, what's uh, befallen middle and low uh, income folks. Um, but when you don't know, uh, you know, what you don't know can help you, but it can also hurt you. Um, hey, before we get to the questions, we have three labor market analysts up here, uh, and, and I don't think you should just ask questions. I think you should have to answer them. Um, uh, Stephanie did a, uh, et al. did a really important paper on uh, the impact of tight labor markets recently. I think it was a Brookings paper. Um, and one of the things you talked about was something I think very important that Janet referenced in her early comments. And this is the possibility of reverse hysteresis, which sounds like a really bad disease, but it's actually... Uh, well, it's the reversal of a bad disease. Um, and and, 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 what, uh, and what, what Janet was referring to was the possibility that my slide showed all these people coming into the job market and yielding benefits. Well, historically, there's been a, a, a problem of last hired, first fired, and people get into the job market, but they don't stay in the job market. And the idea is that perhaps tight labor markets can actually improve the supply side of the economy by pulling people in in a lasting way. And I know you've thought and written about that, and I really want to hear what you have to say about that possibility. <laughs> um, so it's true. So in this recent paper that I worked on, we did find a little bit of evidence that particularly along the participation margin, the extensive margin, that uh, hot labor markets do pull people in and it has a bit of a persistent effect. And I think our result was consistent with some of the micro literature. We use time series data, which I think you know, have their limitations for looking at this issue. But it's consistent, I think, with the micro literature, which has found um, some short-term effect that when people are pulled into the labor market and become employed, that they remain employed for a bit longer. And so there are some lasting effects. And as you said, this question is very crucial because if there really were significant hysteresis effects where the, you know, by running the economy hot, we could really boost labor supply, that would reduce the trade-off that the Fed would face in, try, in setting interest rates. So the one thing I've been thinking about is, why aren't these effects bigger? I think we all have the, you know, kind of intuition that once someone comes in, they gain experience, they create networks, that they should have a more long-lasting tie to the labor market. And I think part of the issue is precisely what you said, that the economy largely operates as um, you know, last hired, first fired, and people tend to be hired into very cyclical industries because those are the ones that are expanding employment mm -hmm. a lot late in the cycle. Um, and, and also then we don't run the economy hot for very long. The periods in which the unemployment rate is below the natural rate, they just aren't that long. And I think actually if you look to some other experiences in history that aren't dependent on the business cycle, you actually see better evidence of hysteresis. Uh, so in thinking in particular about women's entry into the labor force after the Second World War, that went on actually for a number of years and it really significantly boosted women's labor supply it was a permanent effect. And lots of women left the labor force in the 50s, but if you read the literature on this, it really laid the groundwork for women's entry into the labor force by changing the way families operated, by changing the structure of work and institutions. And so I think you know, there is a powerful case that hysteresis can matter. I'm just not sure it's the business freak cycle frequency, at least at the, to the extent that we've let it operate in recent years, that you would see those effects. I think one of the problems is that we all talk about this from the perspective of macroeconomics, which is fine. That, that's certainly a, a great baseline. But it will actually take micro policy to achieve reverse hysteresis. That is, we're going to have to do stuff to help people who face large labor market barriers when the macro economy helps them jump over those barriers and then the macro economy goes south. We're going to have to do stuff to help keep them in the job market, including job subsidies, training programs, and things of that nature. So, okay. Um, well, that was, <laughs> so let me see if we have time for a few questions from the audience. Let me just uh, gather a few. Danny, I think I see your hand. Um, I want to answer your question. Hi, hi, Jared. I want to answer your question about what variables actually enter wage equations. I've worked on this for the last 30 years. Turns out that in the UK and the US and everywhere else, Post-2008, there's one variable that works, 
and nothing else does. The unemployment rate doesn't work. U7 works. And what U7 is, is the thing that drives U6. It's part-time for economic reasons over employment. Um, and the reason it's a really quite good variable, which explains why there's no inflation, is it hasn't been reverted. It hasn't been reverted in any country in the world. So when you run a wage equation in the U.S., post-2008, the unemployment rate doesn't enter. Sorry, Jared, it doesn't. But the, but the, um, the, the underemployment rate does. So that's the answer to your question. I have several papers on it, a new one coming in in the ILR review. But it's the, it's the only variable in the U.K., um, in the U.S., and in panels of, of European countries. Um, so I don't buy your comment that the unemployment yeah. rate works. No, I, I'm sympathetic to that. Work. I'm sympathetic to that. We actually, I, I'm a little embarrassed because we published one of your I papers. I you did say <laughs> what you said. I did. But I, I with, with great respect for you and your work, and I think you're you know, largely right, I do get a little nervous when economists glom onto one variable that they really love. Over that often, period, that often doesn't end well. Of time. All right, Silvana, do you have a... Yeah, I just want to uh, come to your question of why the Phillips curve for wages is uh, steeper than uh, the price. Central banks are targeting inflation, so to the extent that they are successful at it, inflation will be fairly constant and uncorrelated with everything, including slack. Now, you might wonder, okay, why are we slightly undershooting, in the case of the Fed, not the UK, uh, maybe there's scope for more expansionary monetary policy. But the Fed is not targeting wage inflation, and so mm -hmm. that relation mm -hmm. is freer to some extent. It's not uh, um, act up on my policy. So the lower-income folks who are... They can't get unions to help them, so they go to the government. And the government somehow becomes populist enough to, to really contemplate a major minimum wage increase. So how much, you know, but the low-income people arguably, arguably would be the most affected by inflation, too, because they spend a greater proportion of their income on, on necessities. So how high can we put the minimum wage without jeopardizing their security at the bottom fifth? Yeah, uh, I will speak to that. I mean, but first let me just point out, and one of the reasons I really enjoy um, hammering on this full employment, the benefits of full employment piece, is that, it is pretty nonpartisan. I mean, everybody should support that. Uh, and it's not government, you know, necessarily doing stuff. I mean, the Fed is in the mix, no question. But it's, uh, it's really, you know, markets working uh, for, for low-income people. Um, you know, I guess uh, from the evidence I've seen that uh, you could go to $15 on a minimum wage, which is something that's been proposed, but you'd really have to phase it in over a long period uh, because there are places in the country where, you know, $15 an hour gets you to probably now around the 40th percentile wage, and so, you know, you'd want to phase it in slowly. But I think with a long phase in that that, uh, I think the research would support, would support that idea. Okay. I'm going to have to end the panel now. Thanks again very much to our panelists. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.